thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and it has been a strange week in the space industry. The launch of Starship SN10 was stifled by bizarre weather in Texas, but plenty of progress was still seen around the construction and launch sites. For the first time in almost a year, a Falcon 9 booster was lost after a successful Starlink mission. We'll dive into that. Some updates on United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur Pathfinder rocket, but of course the big story, the Perseverance rover. This has been yet another incredible week. So yes, this week at Boca Chica, Texas, Starship development certainly has not gone to plan as we had hoped. We were geared up for a static fire early in the week, followed by a potential launch of Starship SN10, but the weather had other ideas. Texas was hit by an extreme burst of winter weather this week, slowing the plans and preparations for a static fire test and launch. Mary, aka Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight, did not stop though. She was out there in below freezing temperatures. As tweeted here, early in the week it was 26 degrees Fahrenheit or just under minus 3 degrees Celsius. With ice on the vehicle, Mary pushed on. What a trooper. Thanks Mary for all you do out there recording history. So yes, given the struggle with weather, SpaceX appear to have taken the opportunity to speed up work on the orbital launch pad, being that it is impossible to work on or test SN10 in these conditions with the sustained 50 to 65 km hour winds, rain and below freezing temperatures. It is clear that SpaceX needed some serious infrastructure progress for the next step for Starship, so trying to work it with weather and with FAA approvals pending at the time made total sense to me. Remember that every time they need to test a Starship, the pad needs to be cleared and work on infrastructure has to be stopped, sometimes for several days in a row. So yes, a lot of work has been underway at the orbital launch site. Some very interesting new components were spotted arriving and being put together. This here looks to be the launch table for the orbital launch mount. A 3D artist on Twitter by the name of Ol BL created a render here of what this could possibly look like. These great shots from RGV aerial photography here also show three rings of rebar on the new foundation that we mentioned in last week's episode. Now just heading into a little speculation here, it seems most likely to me that this could be the start of the new tank farm for the orbital launch pad. Twitter user Pair of Ducks created this render here of a possible trio of nitrogen oxygen, methane and oxygen storage tanks atop concrete stands. Let me know what you think this rebar is for in the comments below. Now along with all that of course we've seen a lot of work going on with the actual landing pad after SN9's recent failed landing attempt. This beast really bit the dust hard here and since last week they have actually decided to pour concrete over the entire pad, raising it it seems by roughly half a meter or so. Thanks there to Dayton as well down there on site capturing some great new footage. So yes, sadly no chance for a flight, but we did get some interesting information such as the tweet here from some dude here asking for opinions on the outcome of the flight. Can they master that flip and stick the landing? The audience there gave it a 64% chance of landing. Well, Elon Musk provided his opinion of success saying that the landing probability is around 60%, fairly consistent there it seems with public opinion. Interestingly, this is up from the one out of three chance that Elon suggested for SN8's flight. Now along with this information, Declan here who is the master of flight analysis having created flightclub.io, overlaid telemetry and other data for SN9's official live stream just to demonstrate how a Falcon 9 style live stream could look. Elon Musk responded to this saying that it was a good analysis. Even more interesting is that SpaceX are currently working on lowering the minimum throttle capability of their Raptor engine which would allow extra redundancy for the landings themselves. Now, now currently that minimum is publicly reported at least to be around 40% thrust which were the figures tweeted by Elon last year. Even back then though Elon stated that both Merlin and Raptor could throttle much lower with the added design complexity. So yes it looks like that is underway already and with this larger range of throttle Starship and Super Heavy will both benefit. So yes, that is about it for updates around the launch site. Heading over to the build site now, work certainly did not stop for the weather. 
Starship serial number 11 had its two aft flaps mated to the side of its hull this week. The flaps are usually the last main component to be installed before moving that vessel to the launch site. So we're wondering now, is it possible that due to SN10's delays, we could see SN11 next to SN10 down at the launch site? After SN9's epic landing fail near SN10 the other week, I would have thought not, but SpaceX certainly seemed to be in a rush to get SN11 ready to fly. I'm thinking more and more that SpaceX are actually pushing forwards towards SN15, which is the next in line after SN11. For those that are wondering why the jump in numbers there, it's because SN12, 13 and 14 were all halted after being started and have since been discontinued. That flight of SN8 alone successfully passed off on the majority of flight goals that each of those iterations were intended to test, hence they have all been skipped. I think the advancements on SN15 are substantial enough that they could be willing to risk a little collateral damage to see SN15 rolling to the pad as soon as possible. What do you think though? Will SN11 join SN10 on the adjacent launch stand? I'm interested to know what all of you think. Let me know in the comments below. Now, speaking of SN15, its nose cone was spotted by Mary inside one of the tents and now looks to be ready to be stacked on top of the nose barrel, which is already waiting outside in front of the low bay. Additionally, two aft flaps arrived this week for SN15. Due to it being in the mid bay and not yet prepared for aero cover and flap installation, the two flaps were placed on a steel beam structure in storage, awaiting their movement to join SN15. As of right now, SN15 is still awaiting waiting for its thrust dome to be mated with the rest of the upper tank section. One of the most interesting photos of the week was actually what was spotted right here. Can you see what this is? Does that look familiar to you? To me, this looks to be a grid fin section, which we can only assume is for the super heavy booster. After some masterful sleuthing by the community, this piece measures roughly 2.3 meters by around three meters, much smaller than would be expected for a full super heavy grid fin. The thought that we're having here is that this is just a section for what will be a fully assembled grid fin. It could perhaps be a demonstrator or pathfinder prototype. Neo Pork here who tweeted about this earlier in the week thinks that perhaps this is the shorter end of it as shown right here. We are awaiting to hear a lot more about that grid fin. Also along with that we had a sneak peek here at a real life naked Raptor engine out in the wild after being refurbished. This is Raptor serial number 27 which powered the single engine flight of Starship SN5 for its 150 meter hop last year. This little beauty has returned this week for reasons unknown. Not sure what's going on there. So yes, to sum up the week, as always, we have Brendan's latest diagram here. Keep up to date with developments here on his Twitter feed, of course, and please do consider subscribing for regular updates here. All of your interaction from likes and comments helps so much more than you would even believe, and we can create even better content because of all that. Thank you as always for coming back and keeping up to date with us here. So yes, now the even bigger story of the week was of course the Perseverance rover, and I'm so thrilled that it was a good outcome. Around 10 minutes before reaching Mars's atmosphere, the crew stage carrying Perseverance and the little helicopter Ingenuity separated from the aeroshell. After separation, that crew stage was of course left to just burn up in the atmosphere, whereas the aeroshell containing the rover and sky crane continued on for its controlled entry. The aeroshell there is comprised of two halves, the heat shield and the reverse side called the back shell. Both of those sections together of course encompass the Mars 2020 payload protecting the vehicle on the long trip there as well as of course in the most terrifying part of the mission entry into Mars's atmosphere. This is what is referred to as the seven minutes of terror and that's because it takes about seven minutes for the spacecraft to travel from the top of the Martian atmosphere down to the surface. As the vessel entered the atmosphere it was up to the 4.5 meter heat shield to come into play with a velocity over 20,000 kilometers per hour, the aeroshell encountered the thin Martian atmosphere with the heat shield reaching a sweltering 2,100 degrees Celsius, all while keeping the payload safe. The aeroshell's uniquely shaped design of course produces some lift, which essentially helps reduce the speed as it descends, keeping it in the atmosphere a little longer, helping it to bleed off speed reaching its targeted 1,370 kilometers per hour. Now at this moment, the ballistic parachute safely deployed
deployed at around 11 kilometers in altitude. The vehicle continued to slow down as it dropped past 8 kilometers in altitude and the heat shield was jettisoned shedding mass in that process. With about one minute remaining of the descent time, the parachute had fulfilled its purpose by reducing as much velocity as it could. The Martian atmosphere of course is incredibly thin compared to our own with a surface pressure less than 1% of what we find here on Earth. In fact, Mars's atmosphere density is so low that the only way for a rover this massive to slow down anymore and land safely was propulsively. And that is exactly what this vessel did just like back in August 2012 as we witnessed with the Curiosity rover. It is of course the proven sky crane delivery method and this incredible awesome piece of engineering just never ceases to amaze me. The sensors there detected the ground contract triggering those pyrotechnically fired blades that severed the cables from the sky crane which then flew off and crashed well away from the landing site. With the rover there sitting safe and sound it reported its success back to earth as we waited anxiously like we did back when Curiosity landed. Everyone was turning blue waiting for that mission success message and with that message then received and the tension relieved the real fun can start. Its landing site here, Jezero Crater, is scientifically significant due to it having been a lake in the distant past with water flow coming into the crater as well as exiting via the outflow channel leaving distinct remnants of an ancient river delta. So this is a very good location to search for historic signs of microbial life which is really the main objective for this high tech beast. Of course the study of Mars's climate and geology is also very important there with the rover assigned the very important job of gathering rock and soil samples for an analysis and to then beam the results back to Earth. It's also going to hold samples in special sealed storage tubes for future collection and a potential return to eager scientists here on Earth as well. Along with the rover we have an added extra, an autonomous drone helicopter named Ingenuity which was attached to the underbelly of the rover as we see here. Now this little beauty is an experiment to test how well a vehicle like this can fly in the super thin Martian atmosphere and to map out the surrounding area. So yes, this is going to be an incredible mission with all of the sophisticated instruments that both Perseverance and Ingenuity has on board. We have much better camera equipment on this version of the rover as well as audio capturing capability for the very first time which is built into this beast as well. Perseverance is going to provide incredible new scientific information. What do you think? Will we be likely to find signs of historic microbial life on Mars? Let me know in the comments below. It is going to be extremely exciting to watch this mission play out, that much is certain. Also I just wanted to say a massive thank you to Tony Bella here for creating this amazing infographic for the community, a true work of art here. Just check out the incredible amount of detail just jam packed into this one infographic. You can pick up the high res version of that completely free from his website there shown on screen as well. So generous of Tony here making this amazing material available for free. Make sure you're following him on Twitter there for much much more. So yes, it was time once again for another Starlink launch this week and it was from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. At 10.59pm on Monday, February 15th, the countdown to launch proceeded as planned, with yet another 60 Starlink satellites safely stowed away in the new fairing halves. We saw a glimpse there of Miss Tree and Miss Chief on station awaiting to assist with their recovery efforts. With the liquid oxygen loading complete, it was time to clear the line on the transporter erector with some nice venting to taking place here just before Falcon 9 entered the startup phase with one minute to go. With a rapid series of final system checks completed, it was go time with the nine Merlin engines thundering to life. Streaking skyward there once again, we had the stage one telemetry readouts keeping us informed of the uphill climb. With the main engine cutoff and separation successful, it was time to pop those fairings and the second stage continued on its way to orbit while the booster headed back to meet up with the drone ship. Of course, I still love you. With the entry burn shutdown announced at approximately 32 kilometers in altitude, there still seemed to be some sort of activity right down to 21 kilometers where we lost the telemetry readouts. Even the webcast host Jesse Anderson sounded a little unsure at this point. The cross to the live view for the drone ship showed a faint glow in the background that quickly disappeared with what was surely a loud impact startling the birds there on the deck of the drone ship. So unfortunately this meant a crash landing for booster number 105. 
059 after this sixth flight. Now, the last time SpaceX lost a first stage was way back in March of 2020 when the booster suffered an in-flight engine failure with the resulting landing attempt not going to plan. So yes, despite clearly losing the booster at this point of the webcast, the mission continued with the second stage completing orbital insertion and payload deployment. That completed the mission objectives for this flight, and it just goes to show that even when things don't go 100% to plan, SpaceX can still nail these missions. Very impressive stuff. So on top of all of these updates, we've recently got to finally witness the Vulcan Centaur booster as it made its way from the rocket ship at Port Canaveral in preparation for the launch site testing. More on that in a moment, but first a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now we obviously love the science and math related topics here and it's not hard to see why. Sadly, these subjects, if not taught correctly, can limit the enthusiasm that can be had from understanding these incredible languages of our universe. Now what do you think is the best way to learn something? Is it through lectures or exercises from a textbook? Maybe? Well, I don't think so. The research is clear and it shows that problem solving is a much more effective process. That is exactly what Brilliant is. It's a website and an app built off this very principle, letting you learn effectively while solving problems in real time. You don't need to sit down and memorize a bunch of long drawn out formulas or drill endless facts into your mind. It's all about intuitively understanding what and why you are solving problems in these ways. There are no tests and no grades. You just pick up an area of interest and away you go. Start by having fun with the interactive course components and before you know it, you'll be amazed at what you've learned. Thank you very much to Brilliant for their support of my channel here. And if you would like to support me and would like to give it a try, go to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people People will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description below. So yes, wonderful photos here taken by Greg Scott who was out covering the rollout of the Vulcan Centaur booster. There are much more on his Twitter feed too, so make sure you are following Greg there. So this is it, United Launch Alliance's newest rocket which will take over from the tried and true Atlas and Delta rockets. The vessel we can see here is not actually going to fly, but it's more a pathfinder stage which will be used to ready the team and ground facilities for a future launch. For those that are unfamiliar, this Vulcan rocket is a brand new offering from ULA, designed with higher performance in mind, along with it being a lower cost option for those riding the rocket into low Earth orbit and beyond. This is going to be available in in four configurations. It can fly with one on either side in a double configuration, it can fly with four, or even six SRBs. What is quite unlike their previous rockets such as Atlas which uses RP-1, or the Delta series using liquid hydrogen as the fuel, Vulcan follows a similar mixture to SpaceX's Starship using liquid methane. There are a lot of advantages to that fuel mixture as we've explained in previous videos. Now what I'm really wanting to see is the first stage engines here fire up in in the future. These are the B4s, which are of course engineered by Blue Origin. The first launch of the Vulcan is scheduled to be the incredible Peregrine Lunar Lander, the very same that is taking the I Need More Moon project by TJ up to land on the moon with around 15,000 names all included. I just can't wait to see that beast take off. In fact, there is already close to 30 launches booked in on this new vessel as tweeted by United Launch Alliance themselves. That is no small achievement, and I certainly can't wait to see the first mission launch under the power of those awesome engines. Interestingly, these are of course the same engines that will be launched on Blue Origin's own new Glenn rocket once that's ready to fly. Speaking of new Glenn, we got a small glimpse of what appears to be a booster in progress here from Steven on Twitter. And we don't often get to see a peek inside Blue Origin, so that is a nice find. Like I've said a few times before, Blue Origin may just roll out a full rocket ready to launch with none of us being the wiser. That was kind of a joke, but seeing this makes me wonder if that actually may well be the case. Now we are huge supporters of the transition to electric vehicles here on the channel and our partner EV offers the ability to hire an electric vehicle in Australia. Perhaps you have wanted to take an extended test drive. You could be touring the country and want to drive around in a Tesla. If that sounds appealing to you, you can use the link in the description for a discount. A massive thank you as well to the amazing patrons and YouTube members here. There is no way that we can continue creating the content at this frequency 
frequency and length without you all. The support that you're all here providing allows us to increase the time that we can spend and that is all thanks to that growing list of supporters. Thank you to each and every one of you all. As the support there increases, that helps the entire team. So if you like what we're doing and you'd like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House or you can also now join up as a YouTube member using that join button. That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can also have your names listed right here like all these other amazing people and you can have earlier access to these videos to watch before anyone else. A massive thank you especially to the production crew assisting greatly with video production and of course the entire quality control squad here for helping me with all of the work that we do. If you're interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video last week talking about the future interior of Starship with Deep Space Korea's amazing animation. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.